All right, well, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about what's coming next, what's coming down the pike. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have an idea, maybe you know for sure, maybe you have an idea of what specialty you're either going into or think you might? Raise your hand up high. Okay, good. <clears throat> that's most of you, and that's good. That's good to have sort of a sense. If you don't, raise them up again so Jess can get the picture, make it look you're interactive. Thank you. <clears throat> so... Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you have a sense whether you will be either in a solo practice or a group practice, be independent solo, group solo, uh, group independent, hospital group, get it? How many of you know what you're going to do? Uh, okay, uh, much fewer hands. So if you take this group, okay, and you say, well... Here's their solo or group. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? I'm either by myself or I'm not by myself. I can handle those kinds of decisions. But now we introduce some other variables that are really growing. And these are this, whether you're independent, okay? Used to be almost everybody was in one of these two boxes. But now we have non-independence, which means okay, you, maybe you're owned by a hospital. Maybe you're owned by a corporation, okay? In other words, maybe it's physician-owned practice. So now instead of just a couple of boxes, there's actually you know, six boxes, maybe even more. That's just simplifying a little bit. So this is a decision that you guys are going to have to make. And there's a lot of change coming down the pike. Okay? So as we talk about this idea of evaluating your future employment contract, why does it make a big deal? Well, it's a little bit because of this, right? Change. You might wear this button. Change is good. Uh, you go first. A lot of people are going first before you guys are down this change of medicine. You've heard a whole lot about the change, okay? So um, here's a very interesting graph I'm going to show you because this is important for you to know. Um, for many years, the vast majority of physicians who were practicing medicine were independent physicians, right? You hang out your shingle. In the old days, the real old days, the Marcus Welby days, you just go out by yourself, hang out your shingle, build your practice. Then it started evolving a little bit of groups and such. But for the longest time, most here were um, in their own private practice. And uh, some, maybe 75%, 25% independent to employ. But look what happened. I mean, it's cruising along, 75 private, 25% hospital, all of a sudden, boom, he hit 2009, and it flip-flopped fast. Okay, it flip-flopped fast. And now, today, guess what? At least 75% of physicians are in uh, an employment setting. Actually, it's pushing that over 80% now. Soon, 85, maybe 90, soon, before we know it. Who knows? A lot of dynamics behind why. So a declining amount of physicians who are actually in their own private practice, independently owned. So why is this happening? Well, uh, sometimes a lot of factors behind it. We're not going to go into all of them. Let me just summarize a couple. Physicians tend to think, well, maybe I'll have this uh, little less hassles of medicine, because you hear a lot about the hassles. Now, who has heard of the hassles of medicine, right? Administrative stuff, paperwork, da, 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 EMR. Yes, okay, they are there. So maybe they think, well, okay, there's fewer hassles if I'm an employee. And in some sense, that might be correct, right? Um, and, uh, but there are some things you sacrifice as well. Now, you're not necessarily bad, but they're factual, right? We're beholden to our employer. So if we're uh, the employee, we must respond as a person under that authority in our practice situation. We do sacrifice some autonomy to ditch some of those hassles, okay? And so there's some interesting dynamics that are happening with that. We can talk about um, elsewhere, afterwards, if you like. But because there's this high likelihood that you are going to be an employed physician, it's important to understand the step of going to becoming employed, specifically regarding the contract, okay? So we want to make sure you don't make this mistake. The things you don't know that you don't know, okay? So I'm going to tell you some of the things you don't know so that you can know that you don't know them so you can know when they get to the where you don't know them, you can get some help. Great. Got that? Okay. Mary, can you flip that first switch down closest to you? Yeah, that's good. All right. So 
Um, let's say you're just finishing resident, uh, your, your residency, right? Like maybe Peter Huntress right now. Peter actually happens to be finishing his residency. And he has just received an employment contract in the mail from a potential future em employer. Now, here's the question. I want to tell you this a little story about when I was a third year medical student. I had started my um, radiology rotation. And so I'm sitting there with the other students on radiology. We sit down the first day, and, and up goes the first chest film, right? And so the attending says, OK, read this x ray. So, OK, yeah, we put on our gunner hats and say, OK, well, yes, that's a chest. <laughs> Good start. Good start. OK, and then, uh, you, know, uh, you know, down here was some fractures of this chest. Of course, you know, they didn't give us any history. So you see these three or four ribs that are some to displace, and we're like, well, look at that. Those bones, that they don't connect. They're broken. It's uh, rib fractures. And the radiologist said, yes, very good job. You're very astute. You found the non-life-threatening old risk factors, but look at this. In the left upper lobe, you missed the tumor that's going to kill this person. Oh, that's... So the point of that exercise was not to prove we're not radiologists. We knew we weren't. He knew we weren't. The point was this. Don't be distracted by the obvious, right? So the point in the radiology setting was find, you develop a systematic way of looking at that chest x-ray, and then you'll be less likely to miss the important things distracted by the obvious, okay? So here it is, the obvious in the room, very distracting. What do you see in this room? The elephant, right. But you're going to miss this really faint little UFO shooting down some rays, which are probably going to kill this lady right here. All right, so, okay, the elephant in the room, when you're handed your contract, what is it? What's the first thing you're going to look for and notice? Thank you. Yes, your salary. Exactly, right? Your number. It's the first thing you look for. It don't feel badly. It's right. It's what you do. Like, oh, or ooh, or whoa. Okay, right. To now, if you saw that. So that's going to distract you. And you are likely to get sucked into being distracted and, and uh, influenced on your interpretation of that based on what that number is. So I would recommend to you, like the radiologist told me, ignore the rib fractures. Start out here, make sure it's aligned, make sure the trachea is midline. Let's look at the ribs, count the ribs. Is it full inspiration, is it rotation? Okay, and then look at the rib fracture, okay? So that's what we're gonna do as we walk through this. So what is a contract after all, okay? I wanna understand what this is. It seems scary, it seems daunting, it seems legal. Yes, those attorneys come up with these things. Well, it's pretty simple what a contract is. A contract is simply uh, a promise, okay? Or a series of promises, if you will. That creates a duty. Now when you see, and here I put something in quotes, that means it's from our legal friends, okay? Duty is a legal term. So this contract that you're given creates a duty, okay? It says you're gonna perform something, somebody else is going to as well, there's this mutual duty. And the failure to perform this duty is what we call a Breach of duty, all right, another important term. If you've breached that duty, then what happens? Well, if, if, you're, if there's a breach of duty in this, then you are injured. Again, injured, right, another legal term. And, and then you can seek remedy for this, all right? So that's important, understand what that is. Basically what we're saying here is that a contract is an agreement to do something. It says who's going to do what, right? And it's going to explain what happens if somebody doesn't do what they said they were going to do. It's the detail. So this guy here, uh, for our California friends, uh, this is, yes, Christina, I thought I'd bring it up to you there. John Wooden, former basketball coach, UCLA, great statement about the details. He said, it's the little details that are vital, right? The little things make the big things happen. And this is absolutely true when you're looking at your contract. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to give you four points, okay? Four points. It's not going to be an exhaustive uh, discussion on contracts, but we are going to talk about four points of what to do to inspect your contract when you receive it, okay? So here are the fundamentals. The first thing we're going to look at is compensation model. The compensation model. Second is termination clauses. The third point of this 
four-point inspection is, are the restrictive covenants. Okay, and then lastly, we're going to talk about one that I promise you, you're not going to hear anywhere else but here at CMDA Life Skills Institute, and it's called the conscience clause. Okay, so let's go. Let's jump in. Okay, the first point here, the compensation model. Now, wait a minute, Dr. East. You just told us not to look at the salary. Aha. Uh -huh. But I'm talking about don't look at the number, right? You do want to look at how that salary is determined, okay? How do they calculate how you're going to be compensated? It's not the what as much as the how that's important here you need to look at, okay? This is going to make the difference in the long run. So how will your compensation be calculated? There's three general ways. The first is this, straight salary, okay? So you say, okay, I'm gonna be a doctor. Rachel says, I'm gonna be a doctor and do peds in this clinic, and you're gonna be paid X salary. Show up to work and you get paid. Don't show up to work, you're in trouble, all right? And if you work, hard, or if you don't work so hard, you're just paid, okay? Sounds a little like what? Government work, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so that's actually not all that common anymore. Why? Why? Because we're humans, and what do humans respond to? Incentives. Thank you. Good job. So this is, of course, much more popular now. It uh, involves some level of bonus, right? So typically, in a typical bonus situation, you're paid some sort of base salary, and then maybe quarterly, maybe twice a year, maybe once a year, you're paid an additional sum based on productivity that has happened during that time frame. Okay? So, and back to straight salary for a second, and it might not be like we described with Rachel here, it might be an hourly thing, okay? So maybe you're in, in working in an emergency room, and, and they pay, uh, you know, 150 bucks an hour, whatever, okay? Um, oh, I know, sorry, I shouldn't have said the dollar around. There we go. Uh, so they pay you per hour. Okay, you show up to work, you do your shift, you're done. Okay, so there are some that happen. But even some of those are going to some bonus things if you're in a physician-owned practice. Okay, so the bonus. And the, the third type here is full productivity. Okay, and this is becoming more common. This is how we might describe as eat what you kill. Okay. Your, your productivity, your generation, if you will, of work, less expenses is what you take home. Okay. Eat what you kill is what we call that sort of model. All right. So a couple of tips here because the second and third ways are becoming much more common now. A couple of little tips to think about. Okay to ask yourself if you look at some of these uh, bonus derivation things, okay? And consider these, things, these few things here. First is what expenses are going to be directed to you? What, if you're uh, on a revenue minus expenses, what are those expenses going to be? Are you paying for overhead? Are you paying for billing collections costs? You know, what does that look like? What's assigned to your line of expense? And then how are those expenses distributed? Like, so if there's six partners, are you each paying one-sixth of all the overhead? I used to work in um, Kissimmee, Florida with uh, a guy named Dr. Walt Larimore. Good friend. Some of you may know him. From, he did the saline solution. Now Grace Prescriptions with Bill Peel. And so Walt and I and John Hartman and a couple other folks were in practice together. And so we sort of wrestled with what does this look like? How should we do this? And we decided... Uh, this doesn't have to be fair, but we said, well, there's certain expenses that you encounter just for showing up and being a doctor. So it doesn't matter if you see patients three days a week or five days a week, you encounter patients. You're, you have a space there. You call your little office, right? We have a nurse that you wants to go home and be able to, you know, put money in the bank because she's worked for you. We have to turn the lights on. So by mere virtue of showing up, you've got expense, and those are the same for everybody. But if you see 150 patients a week, versus someone who sees 100 patients a week, you're also going to consume more expenses, aren't you? Like you're going to use more tongue depressors, probably check more strep tests, you know, urine dipsticks. You're going to consume more resources. So in the, in the business world, we call those fixed expenses and then variable expenses. Right? 
So we decided in our practice, for example, 70% of our costs, so that's roughly, we would say are fixed. And so we'll all share 70% of the overhead is going to be fixed among us six. And so we just divide it equally. 30% is variable cost. So the more you see, the more you consume. Therefore, a slightly higher expense uh, assignment to the people who are more productive. But, of course, those more productive people also generate more revenue. So it's really a win-win. So that's what you want to look for. Is that a win-win? Here's one thing I would urge you. Avoid a bonus or a productivity thing is based on collections. Based on collections. That means someone you, you, you see a patient deliver a service, a bill goes, the insurance company, insurance company pays, patient pays their copay, whatever, deductible. And how much comes in is what your bonus is based on. Now, why is that bad? Okay, so bad motives for doing stuff sometimes. That's right. So that's one of the potential pitfalls of productivity-based, yes. But it does. But there's something else specifically for collections. Okay. Good. Very good. So you've hit on the issue, absolutely hit on the issue. So what happens then? You've provided the service, and what if people aren't paying? Or what if you work for a hospital, and the hospital says, well, Rachel, you're pediatric patients. We really appreciate you, but your charge is only generating about $60 versus this cardiothoracic surgeon who generates $6,000, and we only have one person working collections, for example. Are they going to work on that $6,000 collection or your $60 charge? Bottom line is, collections are probably going to be out of your control. Collections are out of your control in most situations. Now, if you're private, now I'm talking about contracted employed positions. Collections are going to be, if you work for a hospital, and probably entirely out of your office, okay? And buried in the third floor right next to the radiology, okay? is where that will be. So if you're beholden to them, then you should be compensated based on what you provide, not based on their ability to collect money, okay? So avoid this, my friend. Here's what you'll probably see, because this is recognized as a problem. Uh, bonuses and productivity based on what we call RVU, relative value units. Sometimes it's called the WRVU, work relative value units. This is assigns a number based on what that visit is. So a typical visit, Rachel comes and sees uh, little Johnny with an ear infection, and we code that as a 99213. That just means it's kind of intermediate level visit, right? And that's maybe an RVU of 1.0, okay? I'm sort of making up the numbers a little bit. But, uh, but then she sees somebody who's sick and worried about meningitis, and that's a 992 and 4, a little more evolved. So that's a relative value of 1.6, let's say. Maybe she has a physical, and that's a 1.8. Okay, maybe she has a circumcision, and now that's a 2.2, right? So there, it's, a, it's a standardized value unit place. And so this is probably what you will be looking at down the road here. There's also, of course, a lot of talk with uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act and what's happening now, moving from uh, quantitative measures, meaning productivity, to qualitative measures, which are outcome-based. And that gets to what Christina was mentioning. Well, we have this inerrant issue. Yes, incentives are good, but if you incentivize uh, for every MRI you order, well, if people start MRI ordering MRIs inappropriately, not only is it unethical, but you're compensated for that. So there's this deep conflict. So um, theoretically, in an ideal setting, we might have some more qualitative outcomes. Okay? Now, that's not easy. This is much easier to talk about than it is to do, uh, but that's for another talk. Okay, so... Um, Benefits. What benefits might you see? Of course, vacation is good. Typically, you know, practicing doctor, three or four weeks of vacation is typically expected. Medical, dental insurance usually should be there, unless you're an independent contractor. It's different. Life insurance. Um, ex expect to see a life insurance offering. Usually, it's about two to three times what your base salary is. This is just not always, but generally. And the reason is, you as a physician, laws in the United States, say that you can't be compensated as a more favored way than somebody else in general. Okay? Now, there's such a thing as a highly compensated employee, but that's 
more detailed. So what they offer to you, they have to order the nurses and everybody else. So they can't just say, well, you get you know, $2 million life insurance here, Robert, because we like you. No, it, it doesn't work that way. Okay? There are some standardizations there. Um, typically, you'll get some professional dues, licensing fees covered, uh, fee for your professional academy. Guess what else fee could be covered here? You guys are sharp. CMDA, why? CMDA is in a medical organization. It's an official, uh, you know, nonprofit organization, recognized. We offer CME. We have the highest level of CME ability to award of, of any organization. We got the we, Chairman's Club, no, I don't know, whatever it's called. We're at the top level there. So you, your employer could pay for your, CME, uh, your CMDA dues. Uh, retirement, of course, is, is often there. Disability, yes, you'll find it there. Now, there is an issue with waiting time. Here, let me give you a little, two tips on disability, okay? You, you won't get this elsewhere. So number one is the idea of waiting time. When does it kick in? How long do you have to be disabled before you start getting disability? Okay, and so you can think of short and long-term disability. What you really need is the long-term disability stuff. If they're inviting you to pay, well, if you're, if you're disabled for 90 days, you can't practice, I would recommend, okay, broad stroke here, right? You gotta individualize, but generally, self-insure yourself for that. What does that mean? What does it mean you just save up some savings, so if something happens, and God allows something to happen, and you can't work for a while, you've got this nest egg stashed away. And we, a whole different finance talk we'll talk about later, but that's what I recommend in general for short term. If they offer it and they're paying, great. Long term is what you need. If something happens and you're unable to practice your specialty, that's where this can help a lot. Now here's tip number two. There's often two different ways to do this. Number one is you are given a salary Okay, let's just say your salary is $100,000, Ben, to be this doctor. And now we can do, you're going to get some uh, disability insurance. So option number one is we, you can, we can pay you that. You pay your taxes. And then after tax, you pay your, do, you know, your, your fees for the disability insurance. Or we can take it out pre-tax. And you don't have to pay tax on it, right? And it's not a taxable event. It saves you some tax. Which is the better option? Pre-tax, pre-tax, absolutely wrong. Let me explain why. As was a setup, obviously, I wanted you to make that wrong decision because here's why. If you get it as a pre-tax benefit and you are disabled, that revenue that you get is taxable because you use pre-tax dollars to purchase it. Therefore, we're talking like 20 bucks a month, you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks a month. So not big dollars. If you've paid for it with after-tax dollars and you get disabled and now you have income for the rest of your life because you're disabled, you know, we're sad you're disabled, but at least you've got some money coming in, tax-free. Okay? So make sure your, your premiums that you pay for disability are with after-tax dollars. Okay? Counterintuitive. But again, that's what we're here at Life Skills Institute to tell you about. Malpractice, typically covered, of course, now, a couple little tips here you need to know about, too. Two different types, occurrence and claims made. Let me back up. Occurrence, okay? Here's what this means. This means that Prince is seeing a patient and something bad happens. You know, he didn't do anything wrong, but there's a bad outcome and a suit happens. And, well, it goes to this whole thing, okay? Now, is he covered with malpractice? If he has an occurrence policy, this means... If the event happened while he was covered, the occurrence happened between you know, 2013 and 2015, even though it's 2019, if the occurrence happened, that's in question, while he's insured, he's covered. That's the best kind. It's also the most expensive kind. Therefore, the least likely you're going to get. Okay? But it is the best. So what's the other option? Well, what we call claims made policy. That means he's covered between 13 and 15. And so if something happens in 14, he gets to 15, and uh, they discover it. Okay, well, he's, the claim is made while he's still covered, so he's covered. Okay, so what should be going off in your mind now? Well, wait a minute. What if it's 2019, and I was covered on that policy only 13 to 15, 
and then it's 19, and now they're filing the claim is made after I'm not covered. Uh-oh, are you in trouble? Yep, you're in big trouble, unless you have a tail coverage, okay? Which, of course, you need to have a tail coverage, okay? Which means you have this tail, meaning that uh, from here to when you're no longer practicing, if, if somebody makes a claim, you're still covered for something that happened at that time. The question is this, who's going to pay for that tail coverage because it's not included with the premium? So look at your insurance coverage, malpractice, find out who's covering the tail if you have a claims made policy. Pete? Um, I've heard of something called no coverage. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Um, anything's possible. I would say generally it's not likely, but the reason is that why would the employer want to pay extra for you? And that's what it is. Well, if you're moving and they need a pulmonologist somewhere and you're meeting that need, and then your foreign employer says, well, you're leaving so long, Charlie, we didn't have it in your contract, ha, 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 because you didn't listen to Dr. Reese at the talk, well, okay, they'll probably pay for it because they want you there. Fellowship, mm, probably not so much. It's finances. Okay, okay yes, Amanda. Good question. So in claims made, tail coverage is a fee. It's a one-time deal. Often it's uh, a figure of how much your annual, so if your malpractice was $10,000, maybe the tail coverage is $12,000. Okay, so it's a, it's a lump sum that covers you from here to eternity, basically. It's not an ongoing fee, yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, yeah, and what about other activities too? Okay, benefits, will they, will they allow you to do a missions trip, All right? Now, you don't want to approach it with that question phrased in that way, but what about other things, okay? Is there, can you do some volunteer work? This is a good way to say it. If you do volunteer work, and there's a clinic or in town that you see oh, you know, people who have no insurance, is your insurance for malpractice going to cover you when you do that? So ask about these type of questions. Okay. Okay. So that's the first thing. Termination clause. All right, that's about looking at some of the benefits and compensation. Let's talk about what happens at the end of the road here. Now, as much as you're going to have some happy emotions getting your job contract, it's not a marriage, okay? This is not a marriage. Unlike a marriage, the wise person, I believe, plans their exit before they enter, okay? And uh, I like to say it this way, okay? As far as it comes to termination, think before you start about the best way to depart, all right? Think before you start about the best way to depart, okay? Yeah, so you know what? I know it feels awkward to talk about, well, how am I gonna leave? Nobody wants to talk about that. You know, your emotions are riding high, they want you. Yeah, but this is the time to do it because it will be very revealing. So there are generally two ways that employment stops. The first one we call with cause. And if there's a way to depart with cause, there's probably a way to depart. Yeah, you guys are sharp. Without cause, okay? So these are the two types. So let's look at those two, okay? This is how you part ways. Either you from them or them from you. Okay, with cause termination. The typical with cause termination. We also call this getting fired, right? Canned. But the opposite too, right? Maybe you're firing them, okay? So it goes both ways. So there are a couple things. Typical is, you know, you lose your license. You don't have a license. Well, you're not of any good to an employee if you don't have a license to practice medicine. If you're uninsurable, okay, I understand that. If, uh, of course, alcohol, drugs, maybe you have repeated violations for which they've warned you and you're just not compliant with doing medical records, with billing, with, you know, da -da -da -da, whatever. Uh, or moral turpitude, that's a common one that's thrown in there. Nobody really knows what it means, but we have an idea. Okay, so what this means with cause, remember we talked about the, the uh, contract thing. Uh, one party's breached its duty, okay? There is a breach there, okay? And usually, the termination here is immediate, okay? You have breached the duty, 
you, we're going to terminate. Again, it could go opposite, too. Your employer has promised to do such and such, and they have not, even though you have done your part, upheld your part. So you have an immediate termination right as well. Something called a cure period. Let's say, uh, we're sorry, uh, Dr. Huntress, you didn't do your re records within 24 hours required. You're fired. Well, whoa, wait a minute here. Slow down, give you a chance to catch up and finish. And yeah, that's a cure period, and most will specify this. Okay? So a couple important things here. Let me just stress this. Make certain for with cause termination that there are no vague reasons there for with cause. Anything that's with cause should be specified and specified clearly. Here's an example. Physician misconduct. Well, what does that mean? Physician misconduct probably means something in your eyes. You can think of things that would qualify for mis physician misconduct, but that, the problem is that umbrella is this wide, right? So, and we've had this. This is a real-life situation. I've talked to docs. This has happened. Uh, doctor, we got a report that you prayed with a patient. That violates our separation of religion from health policy. Whatever. Therefore, you, this, we are being accusing you of physician misconduct. I have had colleagues in CMDA that we, have helped through this. What does this look like? You're ready to be fired for this. Under the, I've, we've had CMDA doctors told to take a remedial course on sensitivity training because they've just asked about their faith and taken a faith history. Okay. So the point here, not to be not scary, you just, God's still got great plans for you here, but don't, don't be suckered in on a vague reason for with cause termination. It might be something that you choose to leave over, but nonetheless. Okay, so that's with cause. What about then without cause? What does that mean? Well, in this case, you know, there's no, no breach of duty here, okay? Uh, you decide you want to leave, but, you know, you're, it's terminating anyway. The hospital, maybe something happens. Maybe you decide you're going to be paid more elsewhere for doing the better thing, and the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Okay. Maybe your spouse takes a job, and you've got to move from Albuquerque to Atlanta. Okay. So you're going to terminate, right, without cause. Maybe you see, yeah. Oh, Bristol, Tennessee, CMB headquarters. I gotta be there. Okay, whatever, that works. Or maybe your employer decides, sorry, we, we really, really liked you, James, but we gotta cut back from 10 docs to eight. Uh, and so there's not a cause, but there is something. The costs are too high, they can't get along, whatever. This happened in Indianapolis back in the 90s. This is when hospitals were starting. The first wave managed care was coming in, and hospital the doctor was selling their practice, and they were going to work as employees, and it just didn't work out so well. But the first time Methodist Hospital at that time, Indianapolis, delivered eight pink slips to eight primary care doctors. It had never happened in the city where doctors get fired, especially en masse like that. Guess what? The whole physician community uh, in this town of a million and a half people went, oh, you can't fire a doctor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they can, without cause termination. Okay, so you decide to terminate. So if you are now with, without cause termination, you're going to walk away, they're going to walk away from you. The question is, how long? How long do you have? This should be worked out ahead of time. Okay, how, you see, if, if you're being fired, you're let go, whatever you want to say, without cause, you need time to find something else, don't you? You want to replace your employment. Same thing. What if you're walking away? Hey, my last day's tomorrow. Sorry, go find somebody else to care my patients. Well, first of all, there's an ethical problem there. But secondly is, with your employer, you've got a legal issue. So how much notice should be given? Well, here's a couple of tips. Less than 30 days, probably too short. Probably not fair to either of you. Okay? You need time. They need time, no matter how it goes. More than four months is probably too long. Okay? Uh, if you want to go... And you're going to maybe get employment somewhere else. Well, they had to wait now five, six months for you to get there. They don't want to do that. Right? So that's probably too long. Um, so usually 60 to 90 days. That's kind of the sweet spot, the typical of uh, a, a time frame there. Okay. And here's another tip. Reduce productivity. Well, we're sorry, Amanda. We really liked you. Your patients liked you. But you just take so long. You do all this prayer with patients. And oh, yeah. I get it, but 
you know, you're just, your productivity is not where we need to be. You're not seeing 87 patients an hour. We need you there. So we're going to terminate you. So reduce productivity. What happens if that's the reason? Well, maybe you can uh, actually negotiate something in here ahead of time that if reduced productivity is the reason for termination, that uh, they give you an option to uh, uh, you know, correct that. Or maybe you can reduce your salary. Right? What if God calls you to spend two months a year uh, relieving a medical missionary? <laughs> well, you were paid X dollars. You know, okay, so you're paid uh, $150,000 to see patients four and a half days a week, you know, 48 weeks a year. But now you're going to take two months off. Well, should the hospital or your employer have to pay you for going to Kenya? Well, maybe they will, but is it their duty? No, I don't think so. Should they have to bear that? That's maybe If God's calling you to do that, then he's probably calling you to make the sacrifice there too. So it shouldn't be their issue there. Okay, let's shift gears now. Point three, four, not quite so detailed here, but the third point is this, restrictive covenants. What does that mean? Okay. Well, the third and the four-point inspection is this. If you are terminated, if you leave, this ends, what are you limited to? Okay, what are you limited to? Well, if, uh, if you're the hospital, right, you don't want to lose your patients, right? So they don't want you to compete with them. So this is often called a non-compete clause, okay, a non-compete. So the restrictive covenants or non-compete clause has two primary components. The first is this, geography. So if you are in Fresno, California, how far out, and you're on Main Street, uh, a restrictive comment say, you can no longer practice when you leave within X geographic distance. Oh, well, maybe two blocks, maybe it's two miles, maybe it's 20 miles, state of California, United States, on this earth, what is it? Okay, what is the restriction there? Okay. And then the other component is this, time, for how long? Well, okay, you can't practice in this radius, but not forever. Oh, well, we could say forever. That wouldn't be very good, but how long? Okay, well, so the geography, typical, depending a little on specialty and need and demand, 10 to 20 miles. That's just typical. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And time. And typical, again, I'm going to be typical, so you have a, a little context. Typical is a year, maybe two years. Okay, one to two years is typical. So those are the restrictions. Now, here's the big thing, enforceability, right? Enforceability, which would you think more likely to be enforceable? Okay, so we're here and we're, we have two people, all right? And so Stephanie is in practice, okay? And she's in Des Moines, Iowa, congratulations. And she has one that says, well, okay, uh, Stephanie, if you're here and you leave, you cannot practice within 100 miles for two years. 100 miles. Okay. But uh, now, not too far, Andrea's got a practice, okay, and she's in um, Green Lake, Wisconsin. Oh, you're home. So, but she says, if you leave, you are restricted from one mile. Just one mile, two years. Which of those is more likely to be enforceable if it should go to a court of law? Well, no, that's correct. Why? 100 miles, not reasonable. We need medical care, right? So, yes, so generally the smaller the, the geography, the more enforceable it is. The shorter the time, the more less enforceable it is. Typically, when these do go to courts, the courts typically have favored with physicians. Because we need doctors, by and large, right? Here's the issue, the remedy, okay? You'll probably see a contract within this. Peter, I'm not sure if yours has this yet. We'll have to look. But if there's a violation of the restrictive covenant, what's the remedy for your employer? What's going to happen, okay? Well, sometimes it'll spell out a dollar amount, okay? They've done away with the beheading, thankfully, so we're good. In a contract, okay, so we had a contract in my practice in Indianapolis. We had uh, four physicians, a couple nurse practitioners, and a restrictive covenant. And we said in there, well, if you decide to leave our practice, then in practice, you know, it's, there's a 10-mile restrictive covenant, and it's for two years. Now, if you violate this, then we are going to agree up front 
that you will pay us $100,000 if you violate that. Right? It, just, it was a number. It was this, and it was agreed upon. Okay, that increases the likelihood of enforceability big time because not only have you defined geography, you've defined time, you've also said if it's violated, here's what's going to happen. And everybody agreed. So the judge was more likely to say, hey, you agreed to it. We had one partner who, after a year, felt the grass was greener on the other side of the fence, wanted to become, instead of independent private with us, the employed doctor. Six miles down the road. Problem. No, sorry. Um, Jeff, it's, it's going to cost us. Hundred thousand, we already agreed. Well, um, just so happened, of course, he wasn't nearly as worried as his new employer. Because guess who's going to bear the responsibility? The new employer for violating this that we made sure that they were aware of, because it's detrimental to the practice. And the hospital considered that, and they said, you know, we really want another doctor. Fine. And so the hospital said, we realize, we recognize there's violation. We recognize the remedy. We're going to resolve that remedy by paying the penalty. Okay, fine. So uh, the hospital took care of it. So it's not impossible to get a, out of a restrictive covenant, but be aware going in. Okay? So what's the ideal situation? Ideal restrictive covenants are this. Number one, there isn't one. Okay? That's the ideal covenant. It's not there. Okay? The narrowest geography, all right, and the shortest time. You can negotiate this. Okay? Here's the thing, if you're terminated without cause, so they're canning you because of whatever, it's just not the bad stuff, you're not being fired, you're just being let go, however you want to terminate it, the restrictive covenant should not be enforced. This is a big deal. This should be specified in writing. Okay? So if you're terminated without cause, there will be no enforcement of a restrictive covenant. Now, that's probably not going to be in there unless you ask for it, but I would suggest it. Yes? Good, so Peter's asking about renewability. So he's completed or about to complete, let's say, a two-year. And there's a renewal period unless you give notice. Some of those will automatically renew unless there's notice, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever, six months. <clears throat> um, so in those automatic renewals, then there's a high likelihood that it's going to be automatic renewal of that restrictive covenant. There can be language that if sufficient notice is given at the time of non-renewal, then a termination clause isn't in force. Now, likelihood of that clause written in your contract, not very big. Why? Because it's possible they want you taking their business no matter when you leave. It's negotiable. Depends on where you're going, how much they want you, supply and demand. Comes back to the economics class you slept through in college. Yes, supply and demand. So it is possible, Peter. It's a good question. Okay. Let's move to the fourth and final point of our port point inspection. It's this, conscience clause. You're going to get it only here, CMDA Life Skills Institute. I'm going to tell you a shocking revelation. Are you ready for this? Even Fox News doesn't have this. There are people who would rather there be no Christians in healthcare. True. Sad, but true. Okay? And it's been said. It's been said to some of our members. If you, if you have a problem with your conscience, doing such and such for a patient, no matter what it is, abortion, end of life, sit, killing somebody, if that's a problem for you and you can't put patient autonomy above your religious beliefs, you have no business in medicine. That's being said. Obviously, we here at CMDA feel differently. Strongly so. Okay? And so does uh, the Bill of Rights our constitutional protections, First Amendment protections, so do certain, a number of, actually, conscience protection laws that are on the laws of our land. Okay, so they have those. But what happens? What happens if you're retaliated against? What happens if you're forced to refer for something and you believe that there's moral complicity involved there? Maybe it's an abortion, maybe it's giving a life-ending drug, maybe it's using something from destroyed embryos. Don't think it happens, let me tell you, just real quickly. A couple of people, Dr. S.P., 
family medicine doctor in San Antonio, Texas. Practiced for a not-for-profit university hospital group. Okay, and reported in May that the corporation that runs her practice was insisting she provide contraception in all cases. Well, Dr. S.P. restricts contraception prescriptions to married patients. She believes, with her deeply held moral religious beliefs, that she's complicit when she hands these out. And so she just wants to hand them out to um, married patients. You have to agree, disagree, but the issue is she has a right to do so. But after several patients allegedly complained, her medical director informed her that the hospital administration demands that all patients in the clinic prescribe contraceptions for any and all reasons regardless of their religious beliefs. Dr. P, SP, had to resign. She was retaliated against. Um, Dr. VD, actually, uh, Dr. LR, let's talk about that one. Uh, just in 2007, practicing in the East Coast, of the physician's son of a patient on my neurologic ICU service asked me whether I was one of those pro-life wackos. Okay, who's prepared and as a pro-life wacko uh, want to uh, affirm that food and water were mandatory in his mother in the ICU. I, I did affirm my position, signed off on the case. And then the primary oncologist uh, acquiesced to euthanize her and I suffered as the medical community turned to exclude me. Dr. Uh, VD, um, an obstetrics, uh, obstetrician gynecologist, I received a call to see if I'd perform an intrauterine insemination for a lesbian couple in the late 90s. I contacted my malpractice carrier for legal advice about coverage and was told if I refused them, but if I did so for a married couple, I'd likely be sued and they would not provide coverage. I, it also extended to a a uh, homosexual couple, they said. So it was then I decided I couldn't do this service anymore. Okay. And, and one more from Dr. R.S. I worked in an emergency room in Georgia. I was working there for well over a year with no problems. However, several weeks after refusing to provide a post-intercourse medicinal abortifacient to a teenager, basically a pill to induce with abortion, I was asked not to come back to the ER. I could never get an explanation from the hospital as to why. To my knowledge, I never had a staff complaint or patient complaint Actually, I had letters of commendation. So you will receive some of these challenges, okay? Don't be afraid. The Lord is with you. The Lord's called you. But be wise. And here's one way you can be wise. And this one thing I suggest is insert a conscience clause into your contract. This will not come. And this is a bunch of words. I'll just read this. And if you want the handout, we can get the handout to you. You can give me an email. But here's what this says. This particular conscience clause that we've used with some doctors says this. Notwithstanding any other provisions or covenants in this agreement, which is what usually what contract is called, the parties to this agreement agree that the constitutional rights of conscience and religious beliefs of the employee shall not be violated by the fulfillment of this agreement and that no actions, as may be otherwise contemplated or required pursuant to this agreement, may be required of the employee which violate his or her rights of conscience or religious belief. Employee shall give prompt notice of treatment or services requested that is believed to violate these rights. Also, the parties agree that employee will not suffer any adverse actions, including retaliation, for refusing to provide <coughs> medical treatment or services which violate the employee's right of conscience and right of belief. Okay? This just says it's going to be okay. You're going to acknowledge the legal and constitutional protections that are already there. That's basically that's it. So I suggest thinking about that. Okay, final thoughts. A couple last Minute pearls here. Should you have the attorney review your contract? Yep. Okay, you should. Yeah, do it early and definitely have them look over the very final one. Does it cost? Yes. But this is an investment, my friends. Think of the return on this investment. It's huge. Okay, I know you're coming up running, Resident, I got no money. Yeah, well, find some because you should have it reviewed. Okay, make sure it's a win win. <laughs> Uh, beware of the standard answer. You, I've heard <laughs> this myself, and I try not to laugh. But here's, here's what it is. Well, well, listen, doctor, all of our doctors sign this exact contract. Well, two things. One, okay, sure, maybe they started out with this exact thing, but it's not likely that really everybody, that's probably a little white lie. But number two, I don't care if a thousand doctors signed a bad contract, don't you sign it, okay? Don't sign a bad contract. Contract. I don't care how many doctors have signed it. 
don't, okay? Um, CMDA placement service. Do you all know about CMDA placement service? We actually have um, a service within CMDA as a CMDA member that can help match you up in a Christian practice, okay, with Christian doctors, or at least faith-friendly. So maybe you're interested in that, okay? We can help with contract review as well. Happy to do so. Um, okay, and keep this in mind too. You're going to come at this with different positions. You're on opposite side of the bargaining table, but it doesn't have to be adversarial. Remember, my friends, you represent Christ to your employer, even as you're going through this contract review. Right? 2 Corinthians 2 tells us you're the fragrance of Christ to the world around you. That starts from day one or day minus 30, whatever, as you're looking at this before you start. So be wise as a servant, but be gentle as a dove. Remember who you represent. And the last thing is this. Begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. Here are the questions you should ask. Is this for you personally on this employment? Is this God's mission for you? Okay. Is this position going to draw you closer to God's design for your life or not? Number two, if you take this job, sign this contract, will you be better able to serve God? Our time is short on this earth. Eternity is in front of us. We have this investment time. Is this going to help you do that? Is your wife, husband, kids on board with this? Get them involved early. It doesn't matter if they don't like the details. Get them involved in the, in the big picture of this. Of course, there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Get counsel. Get insight from people. It's your decision at the end of the day. But get wise counselor. Be on your knees praying about this. Fast. I urge you. I've done this with Jody and, and sometimes as we've made a deployment change. Oh, it's been just some of the sweetest times we've had in our marriage. If all that check, check, check is off, then guess what? Walk forward in faith, not in fear. Okay? The Lord has plans for you. Prosper you. Give you hope in the future, not to harm you. Okay? This is true. Jeremiah 29, 11. 